All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Catherine Metz, and I am the assistant professor of ethnomusicology here at Oberlin Conservatory. Um, right here, you'll notice that I am um, in the Berenbaum, in the basement of the hotel at Oberlin, um, or actually in my house with a green screen. Um, and I'd like to introduce you my guest today, who is joining us for our College and Con Cafe right here in the beer and bomb, Peter Ames Carlin, uh, who is an author and a friend of mine from uh, many years back. And we're just gonna chat a little bit about some of the projects that Peter is working on. So just to kind of um, let you know what Peter has written, he is rather prolific. Um, he's written books on the Beach Boys and Bruce Springsteen and Paul Simon. Um, and he's working on a book right now that's actually just about to go to copy edits on uh, Warner Brothers Records. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in the meantime, but Peter, I thought I should um, go ahead and have you tell us a little bit more about yourself, how you got into this, and a little bit about your background as a music writer. Okay. Um, well, I wasn't always a music writer. I actually started writing professionally in uh, right when I got out of college in 1985 and um, freelanced for a lot of years, which is just writing about everything under the sun. And I never, I wrote about everything but music for the longest time. And then I worked at People Magazine as a senior writer there, which is a vast panoply of pop culture. Uh, then I was a TV critic for about 10 years at the Oregonian newspaper in Portland, which again is all the whole world being filtered through the tube. Um, and then partway through there, I began to write about um, musicians because I had, when I was, I'd, I'd always been a huge uh, uh, Brian Wilson Beach Boys fan when I was growing up. And I got, when I was a people, I got this opportunity to, to do a profile of him and uh, hang out with him a little bit and then we really that was really fun and we kind of hit it off and so I had this idea to write a book and and uh, it took a long time to get that going but then it finally happened when I was in Portland um, and um, and that book came out in I guess 2006 and it sort of did better than anyone was thinking it would and then I just sort of got a chance to write other books and people were like well, you know, I guess you write about music. And I was like, sure, I'll write about music. Because I've always been a huge music fan and played music as a kid. And my family's very musical. So I was always sort of an obsessive in that way. Um, so I just started writing books about people whose music I loved. Because it would give me license to spend like a couple years doing like, you know, just listening to everything they did and getting all the bootlegs and outtakes and and then often, you know, getting a chance to hang out with them a little bit and get to know their people and stuff. And so, you know, so so it's been it's been fun and an adventure. And then it, it and then somehow it turned into the focus of my career. So I want to back up for a second because this is an amazing career trajectory, and it's amazing and exciting that you get to write about music professionally. Um, but something that caught my ear was um, bootlegs and outtakes. Yeah. You've gotten a musical window into stuff that most people dream about. What was that like? I don't know, especially with <laughs> Brian Wilson, who's one of these musical geniuses that we all that we all know about musically, but we also have these particular perceptions about him um, personally. And that had to be amazing because he seems to be um, very much in charge of, of his career and his music and what gets released and what we get to hear kind of in a, in a similar fashion to Prince, right? That's, they remind me those kinds of creative geniuses. Yeah. Well, you know, Brian is really, um, I mean, the thing that, that, that I tell people about Brian, I, 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 I sort of found a sentence to boil it down into, which is that, you know, cause Brian is famously, you know, emotionally disturbed in a sense, you know, I mean, he's got these psychiatric problems and for the longest time, for decades and decades, they really, really crippled him because he didn't get, because he came from this milieu of people who were not hip to mental illness and were terrified of it. And therefore he didn't ever got any adequate treatment and definitely didn't get the right medication. And so he was self-medicating with drugs and food and alcohol and just his life was like this nightmare for decades and decades. I mean, I can't even tell you because I, I fell in love with this guy's music when I was 13 
12 or 13 years old. And the whole sort of saga of Brian Wilson really resonated with me. Um, and for literally, I'm talking 10, 20, 30 years, this idea that Brian was, had just been, was like too beautiful to exist in the world, you know? And he was so strange and everything, but miraculously he survived. And then, and then eventually was hooked up with the right kind of medication. Um, so meeting him was very odd because on the one hand, he is weirdly normal, um, but on the other hand, he's just surreal, you know, as a, I mean, he, he wrote God Only Knows, the music to God Only Knows, which Paul McCartney to this day still calls like the most perfect pop song ever written. You know, and if you listen to it, I mean, people compare it to Bach, I mean, just in terms of the, you know, his melodic and harmonic powers and how the, you know, and how the music sort of fits together in this real, you know, you listen to it, it's an extremely complicated song. Um, he wrote the entire thing from God only knows the music not existing to existing in the form that we know it today as a composition in 18 minutes sat down and wrote it. And I spoke to the guy who, Tony Asher, who was his collaborator on it and handed him the lyric sheet that had his lyrics in it. And Brian put it on the piano and looked at it and began to play chords. And Tony sat there in the living room on the sofa and watched him write the entire song. So Brian, you know, it's like, I, I, what I like to say about him is, is that he's, he's weirder than you can imagine, but not as crazy as you might think. You know, because like, like once I went to his house in about 2010 and nobody else was there. It was just him and me and he, we, you know, to do an interview. And I walked into his living room and he had on, you know, on cable TV, they have those music channels where there's no picture. Um, but the sound, there's like, it's like a radio station or Sirius or whatever. And um, we walk in and, and the music is playing, but, and the screen is black, except for this little bubble that's bouncing around that says like hits of the sixties. So we walk in and Brian gestures to the screen and he goes, do you ever watch this show? And uh, I was like, well, sure. You know, like I've heard those stations before. Right. So I was like, okay. So then we start talking and like half an hour goes by 40 minutes and a song came on by this band, The Grassroots, from like the mid 60s or the late 60s. And Brian goes like, oh, I love this song. And we're sitting there talking and the TV, let's say the TV's over here. He goes, oh, I love this song. And he goes like this. And he sits there watching the black screen for two and a half minutes, however long the song is. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. There's like nothing to see. It's a black screen with a little bubble that says like hits of the 60s bouncing around. But then I thought this dude wrote God Only Knows in 18 minutes. I mean, I don't know what he's seen. He could be seen any, you know. So I looked over and watched the TV too. But I just saw the black screen. But, he, but that's, he's, probably, he's probably seeing the entire score. He's, he's probably seeing the entire everything and, and maybe he's figuring out how to rearrange it for a Beach Boys sound. <laughs> Something like that, or he's seen, or he's seen the face of God. I mean, I, you, you know, you just never know. There, there is, you know, it's sort of a blessing at times to, to to be able to spend time with people that you admire, who who exist or have a level of consciousness or perception that you don't have, and it's fascinating to be around them. But then you also a little bit have to be careful what you wish for, because they you don't. Because you, you, this music, this art becomes such a part of you and you project these people in your mind as characters and, and they mean something to you. You know, they're extensions of the music or the music is an extension of them and they matter to you in a personal way. It's like you have a personal relationship. And so, you know, when I sit there and I'm about to start hanging out with somebody like that, Brian Wilson or Bruce Springsteen or somebody, you know, there's this moment of terror where I just feel like, ugh. What if, what if he's a dick? Like, what if I don't like him? You know, it's like, and you don't want to have to live with that, you know, but. It's funny that you say that because I've had many opportunities to meet, to meet Patti Smith. Sure. Um, and I, and I've, and I've, I've said no, because it makes me nervous because I just look up to her so much. And, and, you know, Lenny Kay is regularly like, no, and here she is. And I just. I can't do it. I, I'm just, she's too perfect in my head. And I, and I'm sure she's lovely and everyone says she is, but it's still just yeah. makes me nervous because of who she is and what she means to me and has meant to me since I was a kid, um, which is 
which is, that's just, it is, it's a weird burden, right? But well, you know, uh, Corin, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Corin Tucker, who's in Slater Kinney, lives in town, and I know her pretty well, and she was telling me that when they met Patty Smith, they were like at playing a festival together somewhere, like in Europe, I don't know how long ago it was, and she said that Patty Smith was, came over to talk to him, you know, and they were really excited because they worship Patty Smith. And she's, she said it was like talking to a, like, like Patty's got, you know, obviously she's wildly sophisticated and incredibly intelligent, um, but she talks like New York street kids. So she was saying like, hey, you know, you guys have done pretty good for yourselves, you know, but you, <laughs> giving her advice and stuff. But it was like talking to like some guy on the corner. In, I wonder if she would narrate her book, Just Kids, like for, for an audio book like that. That would be great. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> that would be really great. So listen, tell us a little bit. We've, we've only got a couple minutes left um, in, in this episode, but can you tell us a little bit about this Warner uh, Brothers Records book, that, book project that you're, that you're almost finished with? Because this sounds like a really unwieldy thing. Yeah, well, Warner's is a really interesting company. They were um, – Founded, obviously, by the sort of an offshoot of the movie company. They were founded in 1958 um, and were eventually paired with Reprise Records. It was Frank Sinatra's label that was founded in 1960. And for the first, like, half dozen years, eight years of their existence, you know, uh, and, and as, a, you know, as a company that had been jo conjoined, uh, the initial rule was no rock and roll. You know, there were these older guys, and they, they were just thought rock and roll was horrible. But then in the mid 60s, the company got taken over by, you know, or by this new generation of leaders, um, including this fellow Mo Austin and his sort of partner in crime, Joe Smith. And Mo literally went to the, um, in 1967, this was, they sort of signed the Grateful Dead and Jimi Hendrix in late 66. And so things were pivoting. But Mo Austin literally went to the um, A&R guys, the producers, and said, you know, had this whole new idea for how they were going to run the company. And he said, I need for you guys to stop trying to make hit records. Let's just make good records and turn those into hits. And they went and signed like all these freaky kind of outsider artists who mm -hmm. sounded nothing like the top 40. People like um, Neil Young, and they already had The Dead and Jimi Hendrix and The Grateful Dead and Joan Mitchell and James Taylor and, all, and Randy Newman and Van Dyke Parks and all these artists, you know, mo many of whom became like the hugest artists of the 70s because they were outsiders. But for 30 plus years that Mo was running, you know, the company, they were like the most artist friendly, sort of laid back, cool label of them all. And um, they were not only did they allow the artists basically to do whatever they wanted, um, you know, but, and gave them complete artistic control and everything and didn't pressure them to do, you know, to make hits or be commercial by and large, but they were at the same time, the most successful record company on the planet, you know, either, either the top or very near the top for 30 plus years and, and had all the coolest artists, you know, they were the ones who discovered Prince. You know, um, can you imagine discovering Prince? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, to the, you know, obviously, you know, Prince had, had been brought, but the, you know, I mean, Prince at, at whatever he was, 18 years old or 17, 18, 19 years old, came in and, and, you know, and, and they were the ones, it was actually like the head of promotions who happened to meet the guy that was his first manager. And the first time he heard this guy's demo, you know, I mean, he's just the guy that's the promo guy, but he gets it immediately and he takes it to this meeting and he says, if we don't sign this guy, I'm, I'm going to walk, you know, but they all heard it instantly, you know, and, and, you know, and Lenny Warrenker, who then was the head of A&R, vice president of A&R, and then would, within a few years became president of the company, you know, heard the demo and everything. And, and then he said, Prince wanted to produce himself which was unheard of. He wanted all this unheard of control for a kid, a teenager. But Lenny, you know, got it. And so brought him into the recording studio and said, well, let's just see what kind of producer you are, if you can really do this. And he said that Prince, like, went in there, laid down a drum track, picked up the bass, laid down, like, totally locked in, funky, you know, rhythm section that he put together in, like, less than 10 minutes. And uh, Lenny was like, that's it. That's, I've seen enough. You're the producer. No problem at all. And, you know, kaboom. 
so that's I think that's really interesting that Warner Brothers it's not just that they built up from all these unique sounds because Neil Young was definitely a, a unique sound he became iconic but certainly at the time it's uh, that they were able to go from that and still be able to discover these things these these musics and these people that had um, stuff that was both unique and incredibly marketable like if you really listen to Prince it shouldn't work Mm -hmm. So much of what he does musically shouldn't work, and yet it really does in the most yeah. extraordinary ways, and is now a staple of, you know, most of anyone who listens to popular music, a uh, staple of everyone's repertoire. And I can't think of a single person who doesn't love Prince, for example. Um, and also like knowing what a, what a magical artist that he was, and how many things he still has that he never even released before he, pa before he passed so, so early. Yeah, and what he understood about them was that they understood him immediately. Um, he went to Mo, um, and Mo had started with Verve, the jazz label in the 50s. And um, he went, you know, they were talking, and he went to Mo, and he said, and Prince said, like, he goes, whatever you do, don't try to make me black. He said, because I can do anything. You know, I can play, I can play folk music, I can play rock and roll, I can do this and this and this. And he was, and Mo laughed because he'd heard that very phrase before coming from Duke Ellington. Oh, wow. You know, and it was like birds of a feather, you know. But, but the amazing thing, I mean, one of the amazing things about, you know, you don't think about um, record executives being, being artistic or, or having some, that kind of consciousness. But on the other hand, you know, you take a guy like Joe Smith, who was Moe's kind of counterpart when Warner and Reprise were separate but linked labels. Um, he, you know, he, he, he got taken to see the Grateful Dead, at, you know, playing at the Avalon Ballroom in the summer of 1966, you know, and Joe was, you know, he was this Jewish kid who came out of rural Pennsylvania and got himself into Yale, and his first college roommate was William F. Buckley. It's an amazing story. And then he was like a hot top, like AM DJ in Boston during the 50s. Um, and then got into rock and roll, you know, and into promotions and that kind of thing. And, and there he is, he's really square. He's, but he, but he's also, he's got this incredible radar. So he's, he's standing there in the Avalon ballroom with this DJ named Tom, named Tom Donahue. Um, and they're watching the dead and all this crazy business that's happening with the hippies and the acid, you know, and all that stuff in the summer of 66. And, uh, Joe, um, leaned over to Donahue, like most of the way through this first set. And he goes, you know, and it's this wild psychedelic music that's going on formless and strange. And he goes, he goes, he goes, I don't understand this, but I just feel like it's really good. <laughs> and he went and met him and signed him and everything. And then he sort of, you know, and, and, and what his superpower was, was the ability to, to understand, to hear, powerful art not understand it but still feel the power of it and you know he always had a sense that you know it was just a quest you know they they would all the other thing they did at warners was give artists time to kind of grow into themselves and develop their sound and an audience and so he sat there and the dead made four or five really bizarre records that didn't really connect with the mainstream audience but were they were cool but they were just too bizarre and then in 1970 they bring in working man's dead and then the first you know if you guys know that i mean that's a million years ago now but you know it's a acoustic record that's very you know it's it's it, it's just a very sort of more stripped down kind of folky folk rock sound cosmic country they called it back in those days and uh, it was like joe was like we got a hit you know and he was right it sold it, you know the album went gold and and uh you know, and the dead, dead developed this audience that, that continues to this day, you know, 25 years after Jerry Garcia passed. But, you know, it's just that ability and the, the patience and the willingness to give these guys the leeway to make the craziest stuff they possibly could, you know, and invest in them. And that's, you know, and, and no other record company at the time would have done it. Warners did it and, you know, made a freaking fortune.
Yeah, <laughs> they've done well for themselves. So um, you're going to come back and speak with my History of Rock class in a few weeks. And so the students will get even more detail. Um, so for everybody out there, uh, we will tape that and you can uh, take a listen to more of Peter Ames Carlin. Um, but thank you so much, Peter, my for pleasure. taking time today in our fascinating world of quarantine and lockdown. And it's just such a joy to speak with you as per usual. From my quarantine to yours. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks.